office door and say, what's for breakfast, you know? And uh, We are recording. Okay. Uh, I take that as the, not quite ready to go? Okay. I'm waiting for folks to come in. I can't tell on my screen. <laughs> oh, there they are, I see, okay. Okay, Dwayne, why don't you go ahead and get started? Hello, welcome folks. Uh, I'm Dwayne from the University Bookstore. We're hosting our next Zoom talk on the world of science fiction and fantasy, which is of course my favorite stuff. So nice featured author is uh, the young Terry Brooks, who last fall, uh, unfortunately we, we couldn't host our usual annual get together of wild, wild party and Terry and I make fun of everything. And that didn't happen this fall. I still have signed copies of uh, the last of the Shannara books at the store. So come in or order them online and we'll be happy to send some out if you didn't get that yet. And tonight we're featuring his new story collection, Small Magic, which just came out on sale yesterday. And tonight's event is gonna be a conversation between Terry and Sean. Now I could go on and on about Terry, but I think we already know most about him. Sean, if you don't know him, Sean is Terry's webmaster. Uh, I just found out today that he was originally addicted to Terry's work by his mother, which I think is really awesome. And Sean is also the publisher of Grim Oak Press. Uh, he's worked for The Chains, and he's also a writer in his own right. His new book just coming out is called The Tempered Steel of Antiquity Gray. And with that, I'm gonna let these guys take it away. Go ahead, have fun. All right. Sean, bless those mothers. My mother hey, was a sweetheart. So much good. Yeah, my mother was a sweetheart. She uh, she was the one, like many readers out there, it's the parents that get people reading. And for me, it was my mom. Yeah. And um, I would not be sitting here I'm, uh, without her bringing home that beat up copy of Sword of Chandra in 1988 and a 13-year-old boy grabbing it and falling in love with it. Um, I'm sure that you have similar stories about your parents too. Yeah, I was gonna say, I think it starts with your parents. If they, if you see them reading when you're young and they encourage you to read, then you're more inclined to do something about it. And uh, I, I, my parents had books around all the time and they were always reading. And so uh, it was kind of a natural segue for me to begin reading and get taken away to other worlds. And for the most part, I found out I like the other worlds better than this world. So. You know, I'm, I'm the older I get, the more convinced I am. That's still true. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I'm Sean. Um, I'm with best-selling author Terry Brooks. Uh, like he needs any kind of uh, announcement here, but uh, we are talking tonight in support of Terry's new book, which is a short story collection titled Small Magic. So, um, and you can order signed copies through University Bookstore, of course. And I think Dwayne uh, mentioned a little bit ago, you can uh, still order some signed copies of The Last Druid also, which is a great way to support the store, especially during these COVID times. But anyway, tonight, I thought we would start our conversation off, um, obviously talking about short stories. And um, let's just talk about Small Magic a little bit. And let's talk about that first short story that you wrote, because it's been uh, a couple years since you wrote your first stor short story that published, and it's one I'm really fond of. So I'm wondering if you can take us back to why you initially wrote Imaginary Friends, and I think it published in 1991. Yeah, or 91 or 92. It was a collection that Del Rey's, the Del Rey's decided to do, uh, and they used all, I think they used all Del Rey authors at that time uh, to put this coffee table like book together with you know, full color illustrations and uh, stories by oh, many writers who are not even with us anymore. Uh, but that was the first short story I actually did for publication um, outside of something we need not talk about. And uh, I, I, I had not done one before, but um, the idea, the theme of the whole thing was to write a story that was a fairy tale. Um, and for me, fairy tales are, you know, the Brothers Grimm and, and Hans Christian Andersen and all that. So the trick was to find something that appealed. And I wrote a story about Jack McCall, who was a 10 year old boy who finds out he's dying of cancer. And uh, he doesn't want this to happen, of course. And he spends the story trying to find ways to defeat it. And, and, and there's, you know, there's the usual strange characters and, and odd uh, creatures that are wandering around in the story as well. 
it was right. it was it was a lot of fun writing it, and uh, it it wasn't like anything else in the in this in the collection either, which was I thought was kind of interesting. Most people went off into other directions. You kind of did something fun with it though too. It's um, you know for those of you who don't know, Imaginary Friends uh, is it was almost like your test run mm -hmm. on Word and Void. Mm -hmm. Uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, that process when you took that kind of short story and then you began writing Running with the Demon? Like, how did, did you always know that Running with the Demon was going to take elements from that short story? Or is that just the percolation that was going on in your head at the time? Yeah, well, I wrote, I, I wrote word, the first book, what, Running with the Demon, um, in around 95 or something like that. And it was just one of those things where I had an opportunity to write anything I wanted to, and I decided I wanted to write it dark uh, contemporary fantasy because everything I'd done had been in the Shadow world or the Magic Kingdom world. Um, and uh, so the, the setting for it, I decided was going to be the small town I grew up in, uh, which was Sterling. Um, in the book, it's Hopewell. And it is, uh, it is what uh, the uh, Imaginary Friends story was written, used as a platform also. Um, and I didn't want to use the same character, Jack, but I did want to use some of the characters and creatures and so forth that were in that, uh, that short story and put them in the book. And I wanted to riff on that and talk about the schematic of magic that I had worked out for, that would exist in this small town and everywhere that people did not know about for the most part and could not see or know about unless they were enhanced in their own magic right. Uh, and it was a war between good and evil, my favorite subject. Uh, and uh, that's still a good subject, even these today. So uh, I, I stuck to that. And, um, and, and, and you know, the, this the Imaginary Friends was, uh, my sister's a playwright, and she adapted that for a play for a young theater for young audiences uh, a few years back. And so it's had kind of a long life for being nothing more than a short story and not actually seeing, uh, it, it's not reprinted these days. Uh, and the, uh, I suppose I should talk a little bit about the collection itself, uh, because um, what I want to say about it is that uh, this is this was an, to honor. I had written some short stories over the year for you, uh, as a matter of fact, and the collections that you were doing with uh, un, un, Unbroken, Unfettered. And, uh, so uh, that got me going with it. And then I had a request uh, to do some other short stories. and. I always said, and then I did three ebook short stories, and I had, did that for some reason or other, and I can't remember why. I think that Del Reyes wanted me to do some ebook stories, so I wrote three short, you know, 40 pages to 50 pages short stories for me, uh, for them. But I always promised the readers that uh, they would only be out there in ebook form, so I would have to find a way to get them into print form. Um, but to do that, I had to have more than three stories or four with imaginary friends or whatever. I needed to have at least somewhere around 10 to 12 short stories in order to make this thing work. Um, and the, my, my editors over the years had always said, yeah, you write some more short stories and then we'll talk. Um, and in the meantime, it just sort of went along until finally I, I got to a point where uh, I had enough of them that if I did a couple more, I could, uh, I could go ahead and do the what I wanted to, which was to publish it. And that would be something that uh, they would allow me uh, to do um, if I gave them a central major story, uh, something in the novella realm. And so that's when we pick up again with imaginary friends and word and void. And I did take Jack McCall, who was the character from imaginary friends and make him the central character, no longer 10 years old, but now grown up uh, with a wife and daughter, and looking at the prospect that maybe his career in the use of magic isn't quite over. Right. Yeah. And and uh, that novella is amazing. I love that novella so much, mostly because I did enjoy Jack McCall's early story. And then all of a sudden, you returned to Jack ah. and set it in Seattle. Uh, actually, part of it set in Seattle. And yeah. it's yeah, it's great. Um, and actually, that answers one of the questions that have already come in. Um, Angie Jorgensen asked, are the paladins of Shannara short stories in Small Magic? So the answer to that question is yes, those uh, short stories are in. Uh, I, so, think it, I think everything I've written is in, in short fiction is in, in Small Magic. I mean, I ha unless I do something else now, later, uh, that's all there is, and there ain't no more. Uh, so um, 
I kept my promise and now I don't owe anybody anything on the short story front. So we'll see. I'm not fond of writing short stories, I have to say. It's funny too, because I don't like writing short stories very much because it takes too much work. But the uh, Publishers Weekly Review said, well, it looks like Brooks has finally found something that works for him. He's written some terrific short stories here. Maybe he should have done this sooner. And I was thinking, well, for Christ's sake. <laughs> Can't make everybody happy all the time, huh? No, you can't, or hardly ever. <laughs> there, there is one interesting piece in, in the anthology uh, or in the collection. And I'm hoping you can talk just a little bit about that too before we move on. Uh, obviously, there's Shannara short stories. There are land, there's two Landover short stories, um, which I loved both of them, especially Don't Tell Dad. I really enjoyed that short story. <laughs> and uh, because, you know, it's Mestia and Ben Holiday, and it's just funny, it's, it's, it's hilarious. Uh, and of course, the word. Oh, I stole that. Eight. I stole that title from a fan. <laughs> Did you? <laughs> yeah, the story's too long to tell here, but basically, a fan said that to me as the punchline for a story she had about her family, and uh, I said I got to use this in a story at some point. So finally, got the chance to do it. Yeah, uh, and you know, in, in that short story, you answer a huge question about Landover, which I'm not going to spoil for everybody. Yeah, so don't do that alone. Uh, but there, there's an outlier. There's an outlier in this collection. Yeah. And it actually starts the collection, the Fae of Cloudmore. Can you talk a little bit about the Queen of Air and Darkness, Paul Anderson, and kind of how you came to write that particular short story? Because it's one of my favorite pieces that you've written. Well, uh, Paul Anderson was Greg Bear's father-in-law. And uh, Astrid is his daughter. And uh, I, I had met Paul a couple times, but I, I met him and talked to him at length uh, before I wrote this story uh, back, I don't know, 10 years ago or 12 years ago, something like that at a party at Greg Bear's house. I always loved his work, first of all, and I had read his work. Uh, and, one, and one of my favorite, favorite stories of all time is The Queen of Air and Darkness. Uh, it's just strange enough and different enough and uh, inexplicable enough that it still haunts me to this day. Uh, so when I got a call to participate in writing for an anthology of short stories to be collected, which would riff on work that Paul, Paul, Paul Anderson had done, uh, I right away said, I'm gonna write the sequel to The Queen of Air and Darkness. This is what would happen after that story ended. And so that's when I wrote uh, The uh, Cl Fae of Cloud Moran. I really liked that story. I thought it was a good story. And uh, I, I've never had a chance to use it anywhere else until now. Uh, so I, I bundled it in there and said, I think it's good enough that it belongs in with all the recognizable uh, Brooks stuff. And so I put it in. I'm going to ask you a, 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 a strange question, but I'm actually curious about it. Yeah. If there was, if there was yeah, more, more than usual. More than usual. Uh, well, you know, we've done a number of these things, and we have, we I have, do, and I do ask a lot of the same questions. But um, I'm actually kind of curious about this. Uh, you had fun writing that short story. Are there are there any other um, like any other authors' works that you would want to like if you had a chance to contribute a short story or a novel in somebody else's world? What world would that be? Oh my. Uh, I, can't oh, I, stunned him. I stunned him, folks. I stunned him. <laughs> yeah, you stunned me. I know exactly the answer to this, but unfortunately, I can't think of the author's name, so you'll have to help me. I would riff on uh, the, uh, the Last Unicorn. Oh, Peter Beagle. Peter Beagle, or A Fine and Private Place. Either one of those stories has stayed with me in the same way that The Queen of Air and Darkness has over the years. Uh, in short stories, um, there's not too many that have really impacted me. And I, I probably have forgotten many of them and would have to be reminded again. It's easier to talk about books. Uh, but yeah, if I had a chance, I, I you know, if, if he'd hurry up and die and somebody would call me up about doing a, uh, um, a riff on his work, that's where I'd go first. And I might do Fine and Private Place first because everybody's going to think of The Last Unicorn right away. Of course, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so let's let's talk a little bit kind of what's coming up for you, um, kind of how you do a normal event. And then I think you're going to grace us with a reading and then yeah. that'll give time people time to ask their questions. Yeah. 
and then we'll do a Q&A at the end. So let's talk, let's just start ticking them off, okay? Yeah. Shanra, are you done or not? Done. Landover, are you done or not? <laughs> done. <laughs> you are not. Well, for now, for now. <laughs> and I'm not planning anything for either book specifically uh, at the present time. So I consider that means I'm done until I, you know, get back in the, in the race for a uh, congressman or whatever. <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> uh, word the board. caveat is always there because I, <laughs> I haven't actually shut myself off entirely, but I'm too involved in other stuff right now. Right. Uh, word and void. Uh, probably done with that. Um, I, I, I wasn't even going to write Warrior in the current collection until I was sort of forced into it. Uh, so probably done. Probably, probably. done. Yeah. This is a whole new me. <laughs> it is kind of, yeah. <laughs> this so is the, the senior years <laughs> of Jerry Brooks, where he abandoned his his middle and younger years and moved into new, a new realm. Yeah, let's 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 talk about that new realm for a second, then, shall we? Sure. Uh, well, Child, of, Child of Magic. Talk a little bit about Child of Magic and how, which publishes October twelfth, I believe, this year. Yes, but first of all, that's not the title. <laughs> the title is Child of Light. Oh, Child of Light. You're right, Child of Light. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> You're fired. Uh, <laughs> that's the sequel. That's the sequel. <laughs> that's the sequel. Yeah, Child of Magic. Uh, <laughs> now you're doing it too. <laughs> and you got me. Shame on me. Uh, Child of Light. Uh, Child of Light, uh, which uh, I wrote during the pandemic last year. Um, and kind of a whirlwind of energy release into writing because I was kind of at a, a uh, point where nothing was happening in my life. And um, I had finished another book. So I just thought, you know, I can't just sit here for another 10 months or a year or whatever. I have to write something because it's driving my wife crazy and driving me crazy. So um, I decided to write this story about a character who's, I was gonna do first person for, because I wanted to bring that element into my writing that I had them playing around with for a while. And, uh, I decided to write a story about somebody, about, about people we don't even know anything about when it starts. We don't even know their names. All we know is that they're breaking out of a prison. In fact, that's what I'm gonna to read tonight is, is something from that prison breakout scene. Um, and uh, that we find out uh, that everything, as we go along, we find out that everything we're reading that seems like it must be the way it is, isn't. And that the characters who appear to be one thing are also something else, or maybe something completely different. And um, so I, I wrote it in six months. I just, you know, <laughs> went right through it. And uh, when I got it done, I thought, well, I think it's pretty good. And I gave it to my wife, Chudine, my first reader, and she said, this is great. And I thought, well, that's good. So then I gave it to my agent, Anne, and, and thing one, Anne, uh, and she said, I like this a lot, it's really good. And then I gave it to my editor, uh, Anne too, and she said, uh, this is the best thing you've written in years. And I said, well, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's like a, a dubious honor almost. <laughs> well, she was excited because she wanted it right away to be the sequel to uh, the Shannara series ending. She wanted a book that would really stand out and that would, you know, suggest that maybe things weren't all done. Uh, with me, I suppose. And so uh, she, she really was hot for it. And we spent a lot of time working on it to get it to where it needed to be. But by and large, the story was, was pretty well set. And so uh, the, the rewrites I did on it had to do mostly with the, the buildup and the way it was put together, that sort of thing. But the, the bones of it were there. So I, I, you know, and I'm very excited about it. I think it's a, it's a good story. Um, uh, we've got uh, some uh, little bit of movie interest already. Uh, from a friend of mine, and um, I, I just, I'm excited about it. it comes out October 12th, I think, um, and I'm already two-thirds of the way through the sequel to it, so my pledge that I would not write any more uh, books in a series is already shot to pieces, <laughs> and uh, all I can say is that it probably won't be a 30-book series unless things work out a lot better than I think, uh, or else you write the rest of them or something. Uh, 
But at this point, um, I'm very excited about it, and uh, I, I think you'll get a sense of why this book is different when I do my reading tonight, and uh, we can you can see how it how it goes. And even the reading tonight, I, having read the book already, uh, and and to just say really quick that uh, I got the same kind of magical feeling reading it as I did when I read the Last Unicorn which always bodes well, I think, for, for a book. And, and Deadly yeah. Education by Naomi Novik, they're, they're kind, of, um, kind of, they have some similar, I guess, just how they made me feel, I guess, is the only yeah. way I can describe it. Uh, when it, I mean, you're, you're, you're writing a sequel right now, and, and that's great. And people are not gonna begrudge you that, by the way. They're, they're gonna fall in love with this first book. They're gonna want a second one. You, you, would, you would be hearing it every year, if not. I'm kind of, <clears throat> well, the publisher right away said they wanted the next book too. Wow. So he said, yeah. you've been waiting with this one. We want another book right now. So, um, oh, my kids are going crazy. <laughs> hey, they're kids. So you brought up, so you brought up, um, you brought up Hollywood just briefly there. So yeah. let's ask the Hollywood question here. Obviously, the Shannara Chronicles was on uh, Spike and MTV uh, several, several years ago. Uh, you have a number of properties that Hollywood tends to be always interested on some level. Can you update uh, people with kind of what's going on with that and your thoughts? Yeah, I, I can talk about it a little bit. Of course, I can't give you any details, uh, but I can tell you we're about, we're, we're far down the road with one of my works uh, being, uh, uh, being a, 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 finding a platform uh, or being released as a movie. And uh, uh, we are far enough along that we have uh, a script um, and we have major uh, players in the film business in place. Um, and I think there's a pretty good chance I'll know something within the next mm, four or five months max, I think. Really exciting. Uh, are, is, 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 does this, I mean, as, your, as one of your fans, I, I'm excited by that, but uh, how, how do you feel about it? after having gone through Hollywood one time already. After having my heart broken once. Uh, I, I don't, I, I think I've gotten a, a, a more stable approach this time around. And um, what I pretty much promised myself I would do is back off. Because as a writer, even a writer with a contract that says, I get to do this, I get to do that. Basically, you're, you're not gonna get to do anything if you're overruled and it's always by committee and uh, those film people stick together. Uh, so um, I will be in a place to act uh, as a advisor, as a, res a resource, uh, but I think I am not, I'm gonna distance myself from uh, getting involved on, uh, to the level I was involved in the Shannara project and running up against brick walls the entire time. It's just, it's just not worth it, I mean, my, I've always said the thing I care about are the books. So, okay, do something with books, forget about the, about the film and let's hope that it works out. I have strong feelings about this one though. If it happens, I think it's gonna be pretty successful. And I can't tell you why, just let me say, it has to do with who's involved. It has to do with the work care that's gone into it. Uh, the time that's been spent on it, this has been a long time coming. Uh, and uh, we've abandoned a whole bunch of things along the way. The whole Steve Carell thing went by the boards, of course. Um, but now we have what I think maybe is a better setup for what's going to happen. So, you know, obviously, uh, when I know something, we'll put it right up. Uh, and when they release word about it, we'll put it right up on the, uh, on the uh, website, social media stuff, all that, and, and talk about it more specifically. You and I will have that discussion for sure. I, I can't wait. I, I <laughs> fingers and toes crossed. Um, yeah, and, everything crossed. And uh, Alan Sharp, Alan Sharp in the panel says Spielberg? Question mark? Question mark? Question mark? Smiley face. <laughs> Get over it. Mm -mm. I had to do with Spielberg when I did the adaptation of Hook, and I'm not going down that road again. <laughs> yeah, and I'm not going to ask you questions about it because I know you'd reach through this monitor and strangle me. <laughs> Yeah, don't. Uh, I you know I still love Hook the movie, and it's beloved uh, by my wife. So yeah, all the people I'm dealing with uh, this time around, or would be dealing with, are new, new to me. But they say the right things, so that makes me like them. They they seem to like me, so I'll I'm willing to like that. Yeah, that's good. Awesome. Even without knowing more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
All right, I got one more question here for you before uh, it's, it's uh, 25 minutes after, <clears throat> and we'll uh, you know we'll we'll get to the reading here in a second. But uh, so you're writing, so Child of Light comes out October 12th. You're writing the sequel right now. You're two thirds of the way through it. Yeah. Uh, do you have any kind of feeling yet about what will come next? Will it be something brand new again? Will it be? Uh, I, you know, I don't know. I'm I'm toying with some different things. Uh, I have more stories with, with the Child of Light uh, series that I could write. I am thinking about taking a break though after two and doing something else. Uh, I have other ideas that have been percolating for a long time. Um, and I kind of think I maybe will tackle one of those next, but no promises one way or the other. Um, the only thing I know for sure is that I'm not going backwards into the things that I've written in the past in the immediate future. That's not going to happen. Um, I have too much that I think needs to be written about other on other other characters, other subjects, other types of uh, story. You know, I'll probably never get away from uh, uh, epic fantasy. I'm just that guy. And that's where I'm comfortable. And those are the stories I like. So I don't think I'll be getting too far afield from there. But I have different sorts of epic types of fantasy I want to work on. And, uh, you know, I'll find something to write because I, otherwise I don't know what I'd do. Right. Yeah. Sit around the house and cause trouble. Yeah, your wife can't allow that. That's not. Yeah, well, she won't believe me. <laughs> the ball and chain will come out, and the you know they will be linked to my ankle and the chair I sit on to write. So there you go. Yeah. Uh, okay. So uh, I'm going to turn it over to you now, and okay. uh, you can set the stage for this. Yeah, I will. I'm I'm excited to listen to it. All right. Well, we'll see. So um, what I'm reading from tonight is from is from the first chapter uh, in. Uh, in Child of Light, it is uh, uh, what happens during the breakout from the prison. Uh, it is in first person, and uh, I think most of what I'm uh, going to read to you it will be make itself clear without me having to do any more explanations. Uh, and uh, you can ask other questions later on. So I go with Tommy, Malik, Jojo, Barrison, Breck, Winston, Corey. We go left, the others go right. None of us has the slightest idea in what direction we are going or what lies ahead. It doesn't matter so long as it takes us as far away as possible from the prison before we have to surface onto the flats. The night is cloudless and moon and starlight brightens the terrain. Once we crawl out of the ditch, we will be exposed. It is bad enough that we will be tracked by the rocks. Worse still, if natural light reveals us clearly enough that the goblins long range weapons can bring us down. The goblins have carriers too. They will use those to try and find us quickly, crisscrossing the flats until they stumble over us. Luck will prove valuable if fickle. But foot pursuit using the rocks doesn't require luck, only patience. A sudden terrible thought presses in on me, driving straight past my determination. This is suicide. I don't want to think it, but I do. I don't want it to take hold of me, but it does. It is a wicked whisper inside my head, a dark promise that foretells my future with sly certainty. I have been fooling myself into thinking escape is possible. It is not. I am going to die. As if in response to this invasion, her disheartening conviction, everything goes to hell a minute later. Shouts rise up from the other direction, from the direction in which the other group has gone, sharp and clear, deep-throated and guttural. Goblins, screams follow, and weapons fire reverberates. Spitfires, the nickname given to the long barreled automatic weapons used by the goblins, fire in sustained or single bursts. There are growls and snarls from rocks, and the screams increase. Frantic activity, desperate pleas rise out of the madness. Their friends, begging, a few final awful sounds of dying, and then silence. They are all gone, all seven of them caught and killed. I know it is so. I know it as surely as I know that we will be next. I despair. Tommy scrambles out of the ditch and looks around, sees something and beckons us out. We follow him up in a mad rush. Down the way, vehicle lights shine in the darkness, revealing movement by hunched figures, some of them rocks. Impossible to mistake them for anything but what they are, 
hunched shoulders, burly and shaggy bodies, all of them tearing at the remains of our friends. They are a long way off, but it feels like they are already on top of us. The others in the group start off, but I cannot move. Horace, Tommy grabs my arm and drags me away. Forget them, they're gone. Does he speak the words or do I think them instead? Doesn't matter, does it? It is what it is. We run. I'm not sure towards what, if anything, but I do know why. Escape requires movement and we are moving fast and hard. Ahead there is a building, low and squat. Tommy heads for it and we follow. Is there safety to be found, perhaps? Does Tommy know something we don't about this building? Did he know it was here? And is that why he insists on running to it? Tommy, the survivalist, trying to keep us alive. I have to believe it. I glance back once. The lights of the pursuit vehicles are moving, swinging about in our direction, coming for us. We reach the building and find a pair of wide doors opening into it. They are heavily locked. Curry uses her substance once more, but there isn't all that much left. The metal sizzles and steams, but the lock holds. Malik shoves forward abruptly, seizes the lock in both hands and yanks hard while twisting. Once, twice, the lock separates and the door opens. We rush inside, black as darkest night, but light from the moon and stars illuminates four vehicles, all of them similar to the ones coming for us. We clamber into the closest, all but Tommy, who is doing something under the hood. Then he is aboard and in the driver's seat and we are off bursting out of the building with a surge of power, tires spinning and then gaining traction, racing wildly across the flats. Which way, he yells, as confused by the dark, featureless look of the landscape as the rest of us. No one answers, because no one knows what to say. Except, maybe I do. I have the oddest feeling that I know just which way we should go. Maybe I am crazy, but my certainty tugs hard at me. That way, I shout suddenly. And maybe Tommy is crazy too, because he follows my lead without hesitation, swinging the vehicle in the direction I am pointing. Behind us, we find three vehicles giving pursuit, goblins in each, their spitfires flashing. Hunkered down for protection, we hear the sound of charges, uh, multiple pinging off the armored shell of our sturdy machine. We have no weapons save for a few handmade knives. But Jojo rummages around inside a footlocker in the rear of the vehicle's interior and yanks out a pair of long barrel spitfires. He grins in wild abandon as he flings open a top hatch and rises up to fire at our pursuers. Can't see the results. Can't determine the consequences. Jojo drops back down. We hit a series of rough spots that throw us all over the place. Another barrage of weapons fire strikes our vehicle, bouncing off the armor and flying away into nowhere. Except for one that doesn't. That one penetrates where penetration shouldn't be possible, through a crack in a vent set back behind the driver, flying about like a guided missile gone rogue. It stops only after it slams into the back of Tommy's head. And just like that, he is dead. The shock freezes all of us in place until Jojo screams, grab the steering. Tommy is slumped over the controls. Malik lifts him away, settling him onto his lap and clasping his friend's lifeless body like a parent would a child, whispering to him. Jojo vaults over the seats and takes Tommy's place. He fumbles about for a few precious moments that cost us speed and separation of distance from our pursuers, and then he figures it out. Our vehicle lurches forward with a fresh surge of power, widening our lead anew. I am already thinking about what we have lost. Without Tommy, we have no survivalist source, no steady voice of command, and no leadership to guide our way. Suddenly, I am incensed at fate for depriving us so pointlessly, at the goblins for being the animals they are, at life in general for its quixotic nature, and mostly at myself for just sitting there. I snatch up the spitfire that Jojo has abandoned and poke my head through the hatch. My hair flies out in a dark stream as I sight down the barrel and start firing in sharp bursts. Whatever sort of ammunition we are using, it is deadly. The spitfire's charges streak to their target in fiery lines go right through the front windshield of the closest pursuer and the driver's head explodes. The vehicle veers away, tumbles end over end and bursts into flames. One down, two to go. I am newly confident now, emboldened, the bloodlust rushing through me red hot as I take aim at the tires of the second goblin vehicle, thinking to take it out as well. How did I learn to shoot like this? I don't remember ever having used a weapon that wasn't a blade. 
but the Spitfire feels oddly familiar, natural. Instinctively, I know that if I hold down on the trigger, the Spitfire will release six short bursts, which is what happened with the first vehicle. If I hold and release, it will send a single rocket of it with six times the punch. I test my instincts by taking aim at the tires and holding down on the trigger. Six bursts explode on the windshield, but it holds. I try again, still nothing. Bullets fly all around me and I duck down. The tires are tougher. I have to go back to attacking the windshield. No one tries to take my place in the top hatch. All of them are cheering me on, surprised and grateful that I know how to use the weapon. Flush with excitement, I rise up and open fire once more, this time with a quick, quick release aimed at the windshield. The charge strikes with such force that the glass explodes into fragments. I keep firing, the vehicle catches fire, veers away, and is gone. More cheers and shouts of appreciation and encouragement. I duck down again, grinning madly. I have a purpose now. I have a use, I have a way to vent my rage. I am elated enough to think we are going to escape after all, that we will get out of this mess and find help. We are flying across the flats, Jojo doing the best he can to keep us away from the deep ruts and cracks in the hard pan, clear of the uneven ridges and ruts that can slow us down, his face intense. Everything is happening so quickly, but it feels just the opposite. Time is all but stopped and we are frozen in place. I check the Spitfire, unsure of its load, cast it aside and take up the other one. A moment to take a deep breath and I prepare to poke myself through the hatch and another have another go at our fast pursuer. But suddenly Jojo looks in the side mirror. He grunts in fury. Something's happening back there, hold on. I poke my head and shoulders out of the hatch for a quick look, Spitfire extended. And as I do, I see our pursuer almost on top of us and a fiery charge exploding out of a port above its heavy front bumper. The charge slams into our carrier's rear end and everything goes up in smoke and fire and screams. The entire back shield disappears and I am thrown halfway out of the hatch and onto the roof. And an instant later, the goblins hit us with a second charge and our vehicle shudders, lurches, hits a crevice or rut or rough patch and takes flight. When it comes out again, it is listing heavily and I am flying through the air. Somehow I manage to hold on to the Spitfire when the carrier and I part ways, when I am separated from the others entirely, clutching it as if it might give me wings so I can fly to safety. I pinwheel through the air, everything a jumble, and then land with a shock so severe I am sure I have broken every bone in my body. I slide into blackness and everything disappears. Chapter two, Oris dies. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Not so. She has to live. Is this going to be the fastest you've killed any character in any Brooks books ever? Well, there's, there's, I think, 15 people killed in the first chapter. That's pretty fast. I was telling this story the other day, you know, about uh, I recently got a, a, a rejection from my British publisher for the book. And they said, um, we, we think it's too YA. And I thought, wait a minute, I just killed more than a dozen <laughs> people in the first chapter. And that is the end of it. And it's too YA. What am I missing out here? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, just goes to show the way it goes. Yeah, well, I, I loved it. I, I love I love uh, where the book starts. And it is, as you've said in the past, um, yeah. even even in this video, nothing is what it seems. The first chapter is not what it appears nope. to be nothing. Nope. Yeah, it's well, I, I you know, I really wanted that I wanted a quick fast, hard start, you know, and I wanted a quick ending to everybody in that first chapter. Well, not everybody, but let's say, you know, the bulk of them. And then the next thing that happens is we have Oris discovering the first, the, the first indications that nothing she thinks about herself may be true. And, um, you know, then it goes from there and we get to discover, uh, we have our first contact experience and you know, I, I like this story a lot. Like I said, it moves, um, it is gripping, uh, it is involves characters that we come to care about. It has treachery, betrayal, and a love story. Uh, you know, all those good things. Everything you need in a good story. Everything. <laughs> uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, your shift in writing, you know, third person, the first person. Was that 
How did you progress with that? Was that organic for you or, uh, you know, was it something you struggled with at the start and then you got into the flow? Like, well, I, you know, uh, I, I'd had some experience with this with Street Freaks. Uh, when I wrote Street Freaks, I wrote it four times, each time with a different tense, different person, you know, different slant. And uh, because I, I do read quite a bit of young adult and, um, I felt like uh, the, the big difference between a young adult and adult fantasy fiction is most young adult is written in the first person, almost all of it, not all of it, but a whole bunch. Uh, and uh, so I got kind of, I, I get kind of into that. And uh, because I'd had the practice before, I thought, well, you know, this is that kind of story uh, that uh, needs that immediacy to it, that a first person perspective can give it. And because everything that happens in this book centers around Oris, it seemed logical to try it. And so I, you know, I wrote the first six chapters and I don't know, really fast. And uh, I, during that time, I, I, I used uh, the first person all the way, just committed to it. And uh, I, I had trouble early because I would drift into third person periodically, which is very unsettling. Uh, but after I had done it for a while, uh, and gotten into the flow, I didn't have the problem anymore. And now working on the second book, I, I hardly have any trouble with writing in first person at all. You know, it's another experiment for me. And uh, if you're going to be a writer, you should, you know, you should test yourself periodically with new things. And this is one of the new things I'm testing myself with right now. Yeah, well, it, it, it works. And I can't wait for the book to come out. So I have somebody to talk to about it. <laughs> Um, let's see, let's get to some questions here and feel free, anybody who's watching us right now, feel free to ask, uh, you know, questions uh, in the comment field. Uh, let's see, Angie Jorgensen, uh, again, uh, asked, yes. if, if we missed out on the Kickstarter, is there a way we can still order a copy of Indomitable? So uh, I'll let you talk a little bit about the Kickstarter, because we just finished a Kickstarter yeah, and why we did it. And uh, yeah, I'll just let you talk about it. All right, I'll talk about it a little bit here and then you can answer that question. Uh, uh, I have nothing to do with this other than to, to be the source of the material. That is my principal goal. But Sean and I uh, have over the years, uh, as you might remember, collaborated in high-end uh, leather-bound editions of books. And uh, <clears throat> we have a market for that, it turns out, in collectors and others. And uh, we have always done it through Grim Oak, uh, and uh, through his the work of Grim Oak, and I have had very little to do with it. But uh, the, I asked him uh, not too long ago, uh, what is the next demand here for this? Are we still getting anything? And he said, well, there's a heavy demand for doing um, uh, the Heritage series, the four books in the Heritage series. And I said, really? He said, yeah. And I said, well, all right, you want to try it? And, we agreed that we would, and we talked about it, and we finally said, you know, he, he said, I don't want Grim Oak Press to have to be the platform for this because uh, there's too much involved in trying to do a series of books like that, one right after the other. Uh, we need a better advertising form, and what do you think about Kickstarter? And I knew something about Kickstarter, and I said, all right, yeah, well, let's, let's do that. And so we explored it, and, and Sean made up the proposal to submit to Kickstarter, there was no problem there, and we made a decision that we were going to be committed to very high and high quality packaging of the books uh, with illustrations and with very various add-ons, and that you would we would start low at fifty dollars and work our way up to you know astronomical sums uh, and just see what happened. And I, I had some reservations about the astronomical sums says, hey, they'll be gone in the first hour, which was pretty much true. Um, so that was it, and and we wanted to give some, we wanted to give them something, uh, our readers something besides just the book. So beside in the add-ons, we need another piece of fiction. We decided that Indomitable, Indomitable would be the, the best choice because that hasn't got a whole lot of, uh, uh, you know, proliferation over the years. I think Subver Subterranean Press maybe was the only one that ever did it, and uh, plus it's now in the collection of uh, of the. Uh, of the short stories and magic, uh, small magic. So there, and I don't know, can people still get this stuff? Yes, they can actually. Oh, they could. Um, yeah, so uh, yeah, people can uh, 
here in about a week and a half, maybe a little sooner, we'll see. Um, Backer Kit has an add-on store that attaches to our Kickstarter. Okay. And in that add-on store, I made sure to include uh, signed and numbered editions of Scions as well as Indomitable. Uh, because there are people that honestly, I've already, I've already received emails from probably 20 people who missed out on the Kickstarter, didn't know it was going on. And, um, you know, we needed a, a way to be able to continue selling, uh, these, these copies so that people can be happy. Cause that's the reason why we're doing this ultimately is the, to make people happy. And, uh, so yes, uh, to answer Angie's question, um, just because you missed out on the Kickstarter, it doesn't mean that you can't get the book. Yeah. Uh, it'll be available here in about a week or, or two at the latest, and you'll be able to order it through May 1st. Uh, and then uh, any remaining copies that are left over even then, because uh, we plan on overprinting a little bit here because we want to try to get to as many people as possible. And in six to seven months, we'll do the Kickstarter for Druid. And when we do the Kickstarter for the Druid of Shanra, we'll have Scions and Indomitable um, on that Kickstarter as well, so that people can order their matching numbers together and everybody will be happy. So, yeah, I mean, uh, well, Terry and I still need to talk about totals still, about how many we're going to print and all that, which we'll, I'll probably call him tomorrow about that. But we'll um, have to talk about it. I mean, we're, we're trying to respond to what we perceive to be a need in the breeding community. Uh, and uh, we're trying to do it in a way that is uh, respectful of the books and the material so that it doesn't, you don't get some cheap ass piece of, you know what, um, and we're not gonna do anything like that. We're also uh, going to do it as quickly, not quickly, as, as uh, smoothly as we can so that they come out at regular intervals. And we may not make that, uh, but we're looking at six month breaks between the books. And we feel at this point that we can do something very close to that in order to get that all accomplished. Then after that, we'll probably retire. Good. I don't. I don't. I think I want to do this for the rest of my life. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It is a lot of work. <laughs> a lot of, more for you than for me too. <laughs> yeah. When we uh, this this question came up uh, actually today, so I might as well answer it here too. When uh, we will not announce the Kickstarter for the Druid of Shanra until we have delivered. Um, all promises to the science of Shan or a Kickstarter. So yeah. as long as the printer does well, the bindery does well, the coin maker does well, as long as everybody stays on schedule, uh, we should be fine. Uh, so yeah, we're looking at six to seven months in between. And uh, they're going to be beautiful books because you guys hit so many stretch goals that uh, yeah. they're going to be pretty wonderful. It's, it's, they're going to be uh, beautiful books. They're going to be full color books actually on the inside compared to the previous four that we published. So that, that's even cool just from that point of view. I think, uh, that, I think we, we, you know, uh, in terms of what we're trying to do, we're leaving ourselves space on numbers of the copies depending on the demand. So we won't print, you know, thousands of these and then they'll sit in a warehouse. So we won't do that. Uh, it'll be a limited number of books all the way through. And we also are feeling free with our add-ons of things to change them from one book to the next. We'll probably keep the ones that are, are doing well and find something else. Cause we've talked about a whole number of things that, uh, you know, Sean keeps wanting me to do a t-shirt that has young Terry, you know, then on the front and old Terry on the back. And so far I've shot that down, but uh, he keeps pressing. So I, we, we won't, you know, we're not saying everything's gonna be serious in this. <laughs> no, all, I, all I want is the coffee mug that says coffee mug through coffee power. That's power. all I want <laughs> with the symbol of the out drew in. That's all I want. <laughs> now, let's see. We got about 10 minutes left here. Um, I'll get to some other questions here. Oh, actually, you brought up, you know, why a and you, you talked about orbit orbit passing on uh, child of light, which I, I find quite amusing having read the book, but um, <laughs> I don't uh, know. Yeah. Who well, for their audience, you know, maybe their audience is a different, they have a different perspective on things to be fair to them. And they know their audience better than I do or, or any of us do. So uh, exactly right. Yeah. yeah. And it, it'll, it will be published in the UK by somebody. I mean, it, it will. Right. Yeah. Probably. Uh, speaking of, um, who do you, you, you mentioned that you're, you're pretty well read in YA. Uh, can you recommend maybe three books from your favorite authors that uh, people should check out? 
well, sure, but uh, you know, why stop there? Let's do 30. Um, I, 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 matter of fact, um, I, I, you and I are going to do uh, a, a, a Zoom event with Marie Lu, uh, who has written, I don't know, 12 books, something like that, in this a fantasy book. Uh, uh, and uh, we'll be doing those, uh, be doing that. Uh, I think it's the third week of this month. Um, I'm doing one with Lev Grossman, who has The Silver Arrow, which I'm in the middle of uh, reading right now, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, which is a middle grade book uh, and pretty wonderful uh, for, uh, for an old guy. He, uh, he did pretty good at getting that voice down right. Uh, so anyhow, he's not really old. Uh, so, um, you know, we're going to talk about uh, film into books, books into film, that sort of thing. And... Um, I read him. I read uh, Lainey Taylor. I like her books very much. Um, I'm going to miss somebody here, I'm sure. Um, um, I see I'm already in trouble. Uh, oh, that's good. That was three. <laughs> that's what I asked you. I didn't very say brief. Uh, <laughs> here, uh, well, I see. I read Maggie Stiefvater's work, too. She writes, uh, she's, she's a, she really covers more territory than just uh, fantasy. She does romance and um, why a coming of age kinds of story too, but she's such a good writer. It doesn't bother me. I'll read her books any day. Um, and then moving on from there, uh, there's you know a whole bunch more. I should compile a list and put it out there at some point. It's like talking about the adult. I have the same problem with the adult fiction books. Uh, I forget. I forget what I'm reading in, in science fiction fantasy, and uh, I forget the names of the writers when they're not right in front of me because that's who I am these days. In fact, I don't even know. I know who's the guy below us there. <laughs> Who that is? He looks familiar, but uh, does. <laughs> I'm going to ask you one more question. I'm going to turn it over to Dwayne. It looks like maybe right. Dwayne, Dwayne wants some extra words here, but I have one more question. I think didn't get answered. Yes. And that's from John White, and he asks, "How about an updated World of Shannara now that the series is complete?" Um, that has been brought up before, and I have not addressed it with my publishing house yet. So that's on my list of things I need to do is to say, do you have a plan for this uh, at somewhere down the road? Almost everything we talk about is somewhere down the road. And particularly now that uh, the series is at a conclusion uh, for all intents and purposes, any more omnibus editions and uh, new editions of uh, World of Shannon are probably on the drawing board, but are not yet penned into a particular slot. So We'll see. Okay, and there's one more question, actually. I missed one here, one from Nathan. Um, he says, I would someday like to see a gay protagonist in the Shannara world. I saw in an earlier interview that others were going to continue writing in the Shannara world, possibly. Are there any plans for one of the future writers to introduce uh, this type of character into your world? Um, well, uh, I don't know. Uh, about a gay, the gay, the, <laughs> the protagonist in a book being gay. Uh, I have written uh, supporting characters into a bunch of the books that are gay or that are uh, either, well, either one, either gay or lesbian, either. I don't have any problem with writing about that because um, you know, uh, I come from that situation anyhow. So, uh, I think it needs to, it's, it's like talking about the racial divide that needs to be represented, uh, particularly now with all of the uh, talk and all of the movement to finally get books out there by, uh, by uh, authors who are of a different uh, race, color, and so forth than we are, uh, us white bread guys. Um, and it's all changed since I started when that so little, so few writers uh, were there. It started out with very few women writers. Then it started out with very few black writers. And then, you know, it's all mushroomed. And so that now, you know, young adult fantasy is pretty much all women, a few, few men in there, but mostly women. And I think we'll see some more changes about this over the years uh, as time goes by on this. And I'm not saying I wouldn't do it. I would have to think about it a, a little bit. If I were going to write that character, could I do that? You know, uh, a, a key member of my family is gay. Uh, so I suppose I could always know what, go, where to go for a source of anything I didn't understand. But 
I think by and large, uh, I, I will continue to do this. And uh, there's some of that shows up in most of my work, one place or another. Now, whether people pick up on it, I don't know, because I don't tend to go around saying, and the gay guy down the line said, you know, because I, I think that's not the way to do it. It doesn't actually matter much to me whether they are straight or if people are straight or gay. It matters to me who they are and, and, and how they present themselves. And that's more the thrust that I write, more the area that I write in and write and the place I'm coming from when I write those kinds of, of characters in. All right, well, thank you for your time tonight. Um, you know, this was fun as it always is. Uh, it is. And thank you to University Bookstore for uh, Indeed, well, always. You know, welcoming us so kindly. You guys do excellent work, you always have. I think, what, what'd you say? You The first time you went to University Bookstore was in 89? 89, maybe. Yeah, I mean, it, it, my relationship with you books goes back farther than anybody except Anderson books. And uh, mine with you book, right? With Anderson books, I started out in the mid 80s. But you books and I, oh, you know what? Uh, we go back farther than that. I don't know about Dwayne, but I go back farther than that because I went there, I'm pretty sure, uh, when I first went to Seattle with uh, uh, Elfstones. I believe, and that's 82. So, you know, we're talking 40 years here. Am I that old? Rarely do I hear about things before my time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really, you aren't even, well, you, you aren't even that old for God's sake. It's ridiculous talking about things that, that far oh, back. Yeah. Anyway, it, it's the longest lasting relationship I have with, and most consistent relationship I have with any bookstore. Hopefully come October, we might actually host a real live event with you. Uh, wouldn't that I'm be open? Yeah. Uh, you didn't mention two of my favorite YA authors of all time, uh, Tamora Pierce and Garth Nix. Yeah. Maybe we could go on all night about great YA authors. There's just a deluge of talent in the field. It's it's. Uh, I can't begin to read any of any of any shape and phase of what's out there. It's it's a cool thing to have, but the problem oh, is trying to find the right ones. It is a bigger it is a bigger field now than adult fantasy. The YA fantasy field is much bigger than the adult field. Well, I'll pick your brain about it some more. Sean, thank you very much for coming along and uh, keeping the event running here. And uh, I look forward to seeing your new book and uh, probably yeah. not buying your fancy leather bound. Sorry, but uh, I'm sure that'll make other people happy. And Terry, uh, what can I say? It's always fun to talk to you. We always cause a little bit of trouble. I was trying not to get into too much of it tonight. <laughs> Thank you to all the attendees for coming in. I will remind you that we have signed books in the store of Terry's uh, collection, Small Magic, of The Last Druid, and uh, hopefully at some point in the near future we'll have lots of other signed stuff. Maybe we'll even see you at uh, Emerald City this winter. I don't know for sure what that's going to be like. Yet. Nobody gonna knows. Happen. Yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll have to, uh, one of these times, I'm going to have to make it a point to make an, uh, come down there and, and just sign whatever stock you happen to have and give you some heads up and you know, so we, we were yeah. ready to go. But yeah, thank you again. On behalf of both Sean uh, uh, and myself, uh, it's always a pleasure. And we always appreciate the effort you put into it and uh, what the store does to support us. So as writers, it means a lot. Try. Thanks a lot. Everybody have a good night. Hopefully we'll see you later this month for some more events. Bye-bye. Take care.